Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. This is our uh, video chat for the day. Um, what I'm gonna do is go through uh, the notes uh, that we uh, didn't hit up uh, the other day uh, and hope that you look through these uh, either tonight uh, or through the day on Thursday or even uh, before class on Friday. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna essentially go through uh, the PowerPoint um, and hit on some things that we did hit on the other day, but even uh, with a little bit more depth. And then uh, instead of posting a narrated PowerPoint, I'm just gonna post this video and you can pause it and go through it uh, whenever you want. So hopefully this works. Uh, give me some feedback. Let me know what you guys think uh, when we get into class on Friday. So let's go ahead and, and, and get into our notes here, all right, uh, from the other day. So again, this is gonna be our PowerPoint uh, and this will be, uh, this will kind of take the place of the narrated um, PowerPoint uh, thing that we were looking at last week. All right. So here's where we want to start. And this is where we were getting uh, into uh, from last week and then into Monday. Um, I, basically what I did here is I put together a, an entire list of things that you guys uh, did a great job and came up with in uh, our discussion the other day about what you would put into your definition of nationalism. The biggest thing we're gonna go over today and get into with our notes is I want to focus on these areas down here, that nationalism is extremely romantic and emotional, okay? Uh, things about um, jingoism, which is a term that I want you to look up, um, where very, very intense nationalistic spirit starts to get channeled into um, militaristic things, violent things, um, and even imperialistic desires at the end of, uh, of our chat today. And then, uh, especially down here, when we get into uh, songs and symbols and flags and things that we're going to look at, um, and hopefully that you'll look at today, tomorrow, and getting into class on Friday. Uh, and with our forum post, uh, and with the CPA that we're doing, where you try and figure out uh, which national anthem you find most interesting and which national anthem um, you really want to talk about. All right. Uh, so again, uh, this is uh, what we looked at the other day very briefly, uh, the map of Europe uh, right after Napoleon. Okay. So remember France is kind of put back in their, um, in their box and their borders uh, after Napoleon is defeated in 1815. And then what, Remember what they tried to do at the uh, Congress of Vienna in 1815 is they tried to do their hardest to make sure that this area in Germany did not link up. Okay, they wanted to keep them separate. They wanted basically Germany to kind of be like um, a bunch of different states that spoke German, but they wanted to try and play their rivalries off of one another. Like, for instance, you know, Prussia up here in the north with its huge capital of Berlin. And then down here in the south in the areas like Bavaria and other areas, they wanted to kind of play their rivalries against one another and make sure that they didn't link up because everybody knew. Great Britain knew, France knew, Austria knew, Russia, all of the powers of Europe knew that if this thing linked up, and became a cohesive national unit and becomes Germany, that none of them could match it. Because German power in this area, this is like the breadbasket essentially of Europe. Germany had all kinds of industrial uh, might and power and strength and, and factories. Germany had uh, the ability to produce massive amounts of food in this area. Uh, you know, with uh, different, uh, you know, like uh, breads and cereals and wheat and all that good stuff uh, from that area. All right. So nobody wanted Germany to, to link up and get together uh, because they realized uh, that they would all be in for it uh, if that happened. Um, and then again, I just want to uh, talk briefly about this uh, image uh, from page 721 of your book. Um, this is big because basically what this image talks about is how as much as those guys at that 1815 meeting tried, they couldn't keep nationalism down. They, it was just 
it was like, you know, it was like a pop bottle or so a soda bottle that had been um, shooken up and, and it was, it was going to come out, you know, they, they, they couldn't figure out how to put the cap back on everybody's nationalistic feelings. Everybody wanted a nation of their own. And as you can see here, you get the French flag, the German flag, the Italian flag, and many other flags down the line. And one of the interesting things that you guys are going to look up with these flags is many of the flags of Europe, and especially the ones we're going to look at today with France and Germany and Italy, they're all going to have three colors. And they're all going to be called the tricolor. Okay. And why they have three colors is really interesting um, because if you think about it, there's three elements to European society uh, during this time period and for basically all of European history back to the Middle Ages. There were those three levels of society. You had the uh, very upper class, like the royalty, the elites, uh, the very upper, upper echelon of classes. Then you had the kind of middling merchant classes um, who mingled in between the elites and then the very kind of lower class working classes from where you get a lot of the um, foot soldiers. Um, and then in that middle class, you get like the commanders, the generals and those types of things. So why there's three colors is because you get that upper class, middle class, lower class linking together. All right, and and each flag, for instance, represents their upper, middle, and lower class, their working classes with different colors. Okay, so for instance, you'll see with France, their their upper class um, and middle class and lower class. Now, usually, generally, you'll see a red in every one of these flags. You see red. The lower class, the workers, all right, are always going to be depicted as red the red color is always going to be the class of the working, the color of the working class. Um, when we get to, you know, Russia and the Russian revolution and why, um, you know, uh, the Soviet Union's flag was red, the communist flag of modern China. Okay. Everybody kind of forgets that China is a communist, uh, uh, essentially totalitarian state through and through their color of their flag, red. Okay. So you have these workers, um, uh, lower classes, uh, which eventually is going to morph into, you know, Marxist uh, desires and belief and communistic desires and belief. We're going to talk about that next week. Um, the lower working class is always depicted with the color red. All right. And so each flag is going to have red in it, as you can see um, with this, uh, with this image. Um, we talked again briefly uh, about this the other day. Um, about Bismarck uh, and, and what Bismarck is all about. Okay, and you can see him here um, in in the uh, in the image. Like I said the other day, one of the great, um, one of the great uh, mustaches in, in all of uh, military or European history. Um, I like to call this one the walrus. All right, this is the walrus mustache. It's a great mustache. Um, and we talked briefly the other day, uh, essentially the big word to come out of Bismarck, okay, and he was kind of like Germany's founding father, all right, that's just, it's, you know, one of the ways that people um, memorialize him is he's the guy that linked Germany up together and made them this power that they still are in the middle of Europe. And he was a big believer that this could be done by very smart elite men, militaristically minded men, very highly educated individuals. And he was a big believer in state power, as you can see here, I'm circling that state power. This, like I said the other day, I mentioned this and let's pick back up on it. This is what he felt was the politics of reality, okay? You have these idealistic politics. See, I remember he, he always felt that the United States and our ideals that we talk about, you know, of, you know, equality and, um, you know, uh, uh, every man with a vote, those types of things that the United States put in their founding documents, he felt like those were too idealistic and not realistic and that it's never going to work. Um, now, he's been proven wrong uh, over the decades and the centuries um, since his time period, but he was a big believer that the state the state had to be the one in charge, and then rights and um, regulations and those things, they all came down from people who knew better, 
the smart guys, uh, the smart people uh, in our government. Now, we have a lot of those things going on today if you want to make a modern connection. There's certainly lots of individuals within our current American government that um, believe that, you know, the uneducated, the lower, uh, you know, middling and working class individuals in the, United, in the United States just need to sit back and let the smart people figure it out. I don't know, maybe you believe, you believe in that or agree with that or not. I certainly don't. Uh, but maybe that's um, where you guys are. He's a big believer in the politics of reality. Okay. He doesn't like liberalism. He doesn't like democracy. He doesn't like voting. We talked about that the other day. Okay. So how do you get Germany together? How do you link this thing up? You've got to do it militarily all right, with war. All right? It's the only sort of tried and true method of linking up a country is gathering up your military strength, beating up the other countries around you, okay, and making everyone realize that you are not to be messed with. Uh, and that's exactly what Germany does. They, they really quickly establish their borders. I'm going to click ahead here um, to a, a map on the next slide real quick. All right. Look at where you have um, down here. Let me move my picture a little bit up here. You have Germany right in the middle of Europe. Okay. And to its southeast, you have this big power called Austria. To its west and southwest, you have France. All right. Italy, we'll get back to in a minute. But basically what Germany has to do is they've got to solidify their western border. And that means that they have got to beat up France in a war. All right. And they've got to solidify their eastern border, which means they got to knock out Austria and basically not get into a war with Russia, but tell Russia, we're going to unite up and this is going to be our border. And we're going to take parts of this place that in the modern world is known as Poland. Okay. And you're going to let us do it. Uh, or we're going to confront you with warfare. And so Bismarck was a big believer. If we can come back to the previous slide, Bismarck was a big believer in using military might and using the threat of war. Okay. He doesn't fight many wars. It's just these two in 1870. All right, everybody like, likes to blame Bismarck for being this warmonger and this guy who did all these terrible militaristic things. He only really fights, and he has Germany fight two wars. Two, all right? And they're in 1870, and they crush Austria to their east, and they crush France to their west, and everybody is put on notice, and they're like, uh-oh. Um, what we thought was going to happen if Germany linked up was exactly what happened. And in 1871, if we can come back to this map, you get the proclamation of this German empire, which is this um, kind of purpley border. Germany is now a nation, okay? They're no longer just a collection of states that all speak German. They're a country, okay? And they produce a national anthem. Okay, that we're going to look at on this next slide. All right, and I want you guys to listen to. You can kind of stop the video uh, here uh, if you want to listen to that national anthem. But I want to talk just a little bit more about Bismarck uh, before we get into that national anthem. Again, um, just a you know great image of Bismarck here. The guy always wanted to project military power, so he never. Um, you would never see images or pictures of Bismarck without this militaristic picture of him. And again, look at that mustache. What a fantastic mustache that is. Um, but this is a very common German military helmet. All right. And he liked to project power. Okay. And that's what, the, that's the thing. He was all into the threat of power and making people realize you don't want to get into a war with us, with the Germans, because you know, we're going to beat you. Okay, and that's the thing. That's why he was called the Iron Chancellor. And that's where you get from this great speech that he gave down here, bottom right of the slide. He says, the great questions of the day will not be settled by means of speeches and majority decisions. That means democracy. He says, a lot of you nations, English, Americans, you guys like to sit around and have these huge, big debates in your parliaments and your Congress, and you guys never get anything done. 
is what he says. He has never get anything done. We get stuff done. It's essentially what he says in Germany. And how do we do it? We do it with iron and blood. Now that is aggressive. It's um, violent in some ways. It's certainly militaristic. It's a thing that not a lot of people like, uh, but it's also Bismarck's um, proof was in the pudding. He got stuff done uh, and he unified Germany up. And basically, I love this quote over here on, on the left side of your slide. People said, Bismarck, tell us a little bit about your governing. And he goes, well, um, the less people know about how sausages and laws are made, the better they'll sleep at night. <laughs> now, that is an awesome, awesome quote. Basically, what he says is, you people who aren't in government and aren't qualified to be in government, everybody else, the workers, um, the merchants, uh, the butchers, the bakers, the candlestick makers, you guys worry about your life, worry about your uh, families, worry about your jobs, um, worry about your sports. Uh, in the modern world, you know, just you go watch your TV, watch your Netflix, uh, go play with your TikToks, all that stuff. You don't worry about the government. Leave that to the smart people. Leave that to us, okay? Because it's icky. It's icky and there's lots of mm, unclean and impure stuff that goes on in governing, okay? So, don't worry about how the law is made. Just enjoy the law. Enjoy our military power because just like a sausage or a hot dog, it tastes good, but you don't want to see a sausage or a hot dog getting made because it's not a pleasant experience. Okay. So basically what he says is enjoy your hot dog. Don't ask how it's made. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of, another joke some people you know do sometimes with, you know, with Kentucky fried chicken, man, like, Kentucky Fried Chicken's good. I don't know how Colonel Sanders does it. Uh, and if you looked kind of into how the mass production of, of that chicken is made, it kind of gives you the willy sometimes. You maybe wouldn't eat Kentucky Fried Chicken if you knew how uh, that chicken was mass produced. Bismarck was the same way, just with government. All right. Don't worry about how I'm making laws. Just enjoy the fact that Germany is now a gigantic military power and that you are getting jobs out of it, you are getting protection out of it, all right, and you are getting this feeling uh, that you're number one, all right, and that brings us to that slide, that next slide that we want to look at, all right, which is what I want you guys to do now if you want to pause it or if you want to, like I said, it, it, when you get a chance now, listen now to the German national anthem, the Deutschland lead, okay, as, as, as it's called in, in German, the Song of the Germans. And they had that line, uh, Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. All right? Basically, Germany over everyone. Like I said the other day during our Zoom meeting, um, I, I couldn't imagine the bleep storm that would come if the United States' national anthem said, America, America over everybody. Uh, I mean, the, there's no way people would would have a, a fit uh, over that. But that's the way that the Germans like to portray themselves, and that's how their national anthem reads and it sounds. And you can see with this great picture, you see Bismarck right here in the middle of this picture during the proclamation of the German Empire. Here's the guy who becomes essentially the king of Germany. All right, His name was Wilhelm I, and then his son Wilhelm II uh, will be the uh, German King during uh, in all the craziness of World War I. But don't mistake the fact that right in the middle of this picture is Bismarck. Not the king, Bismarck is right in the middle of it all. Okay, and that's exactly what they want you to see uh, in this picture of the proclamation of the German Empire. Other places, because now Germany links up, because Germany now is this. Um, centralizing factor in Europe, all right? Other places now and other peoples rightly say, I want my own country. Why can't we have our own uh, place, our own military, our own flag, all right? And that is exactly what happens next with Italy. 
Okay. Basically what happens is Italy has, was yearning and wanting uh, to link up as a country. All right. And so what happens is after Germany knocks France and knocks Austria out and links up, okay, basically what Germany does is, is they tell France and Austria, there was a lot of French power here. Okay. Looking at the map where we've kind of zoomed in on Italy here. All right, this is where the Alps are, and right? this is where some, you, know, you can get some good skiing in, all that good stuff. All right? But here is France, and here is where Austria is. And basically what Germany told France and Austria after they beat them up in those wars is they said, get out, get out of Italy. You're not allowed to be there anymore. Okay, we're in charge of Europe now, is what Germany is basically telling France and Austria. And the Italians love it. All right? The Italians absolutely love it. They become allies with the Germans. And this makes perfect sense to Bismarck uh, because Bismarck was the politics of reality guy. And he's like, hmm, we got a brand new nation that's forming up here in Italy. What do brand new nations need? Because they're kind of weak and unstable at first. They need big, powerful buddies. They need big, powerful friends. All right. Our American nation was no different. We needed big, powerful, strong friends when we started. All right. And we initially started to, we, we had a great friendship with the French early on in our culture and our country. And then that kind of wavered. And then we were like, all right, um, England, will you be our friend? And we, we kind of developed this fantastic relationship with the UK that we still have to this day. Um, we're still allies with, with Britain through thick and thin. Uh, we have been since uh, very early on in the 1800s. Um, after they kicked our butt in that war of 1812, we've been kind of buddies ever since. Italy links up now, guys, in the 1870s for the first time in centuries. All right, so for the first time since the Roman Empire, you finally have now for the first time since the Roman Empire, you finally have an Italy that is unified. That's crazy to think about. First time since the Roman Empire. It's nuts, all right? And you can see that in this map here, all right? Uh, and please do a little reading, page 724 to 727, all right, in your books. Do a little reading, get a little background, a little, some more W's on this stuff um, uh, going through. This cartoon's awesome. All right, page 727 of your text talks about um, a guy named Giuseppe Garibaldi. Um, this guy, Giuseppe Garibaldi, the, the, the dude kneeling down here, he is, and we talked about a lot of George Washington type figures. This guy's kind of Italy's George Washington. He's the guy that, that links the army up and unites Italy together in a giant militaristic and social and cultural bond. And so the Italians love Giuseppe Garibaldi to this day. You go over to Italy, all right, and once, hopefully once all this uh, corona stuff blows over, go to Italy, get there, get you a glass of wine and cheers, Giuseppe Garibaldi. People will. People will love you, all right, uh, because they'll, they'll know that you know a little bit about uh, their history. And this cartoon is awesome because he's putting on the boot on the king, all right? Um, the, the king of Italy, you don't need to remember his name. I'm not going to give it to you here because I don't want to confuse you with too many names. But the king of Italy is getting his boot. And everybody knows Italy is the country that's shaped like a boot. And that's why it's, this um, cartoon is awesome. So now when you get a chance... Pause here, get out of here, listen to the Italian national anthem, my personal favorite, all right, because it wraps up all of the stuff that you talked about and we talked about with nationalism. Sacrifice, brotherhood, coming together. They use all these words, okay? Fratelli, all right? They use this Italian word fratelli, which means brothers, brotherhood, okay? They use a word called cohort in the Italian national anthem. Basically what a cohort is, is come together as a group, okay? A linked group, a cohort. Listen to that national anthem now and just get into that brotherhood and that sacrifice. And it, Italy uh, is all of us together. And the way that they sing it is just, is, is just fantastic. So enjoy that national anthem um, and, and realize that Italy now has become a country in the middle of Europe, just as Germany has. And not to leave anybody out, okay? Um, you have the French situation here. Again, look at this flag, okay? Look at the tricolor of the French flag, 
Okay, you got the working class here. All right, you got the uh, white was generally seen as the uh, um, the color of 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 royalty. All right, and then you have um, here the blue signifying the uh, uh, merchant classes, the middling classes, and in France. They also, if you read your book, please do, 720, 722, France undergoes a ton of social and cultural revolutions during this time period. Political revolutions <clears throat> all over the place. And one of the things that starts to happen is nationalistic desires start creeping out and becoming more and more and more prevalent <clears throat> in uh, French society as these social cultural revolutions start to happen right and in 1870 again there's, there's all these dates kind of coming around right? at the same time they adopt their national anthem called the marseillaise right um go and listen to this one now to to get a sense of the nationalistic elements of the french national anthem but boy um this one if you've listened to it already or if you're getting ready to listen to it this one kind of after a minute or so, takes a hard left uh, into uh, Awkwardville. Um, let me know what you guys think about it, because uh, it gets real interesting real quick during the French National Anthem. They certainly talk about their brotherhood. Uh, they want to come together as citizens. You'll hear that word a lot in their National Anthem, citizens, unite, all right? Um, but it's also a little icky and a little violent in this national anthem, and hopefully you can pick up on that. France's nationalistic desires, once they link up and they become a more, for lack of a better term, you know, normalized European country, just like Germany uh, and, and Italy were becoming, everybody's got to have an outlet for their nationalism. Because remember, what Germany does, guys, what Germany does is they link everybody and they uh, lock everybody in to the European situation, to the, um, to the map, okay? The problem is, is that nationalistic desires don't like to be bottled up. Nationalistic desires like to reach outward. They like to project outwards. All right. They like to um, within our within our American history, we had nationalistic desires and we kept moving westward. It was called manifest destiny. Let's take the American ideals out west. Okay. And so that we go from sea to shining sea. It's hard to bottle up nationalism. All right. But that's what Bismarck tries to do. This is such a great picture. Look at Bismarck right in the middle of the picture. There he is. All right. Big giant guy too. Bismarck was a gigantic hulking figure. Okay. You just, um, he was the biggest guy in the, in most rooms and people generally listen to the, the big guys in the rooms most of the time. Um, and he's holding a meeting here in Berlin in 1885. You can look down to this, to the notes down here. He's holding a meeting in Berlin in 1885. And what they do is they get all the, basically all the countries of Europe together. You can see them all here, right? You can see the countries of the Ottoman Empire, modern day Turkey over here, right? Um, you can see uh, the British prime minister here. You can see the czar uh, of Russia here. Everybody's at this meeting. And basically what Bismarck is doing, look at the handshake, look at the alliances. He's making alliances with everybody over this table, right? And they're basically coming to an agreement. We're not going to go to war with each other, okay? Because if you attack Russia, then I'm going to attack you. Or if you attack France, then both of us are going to attack you. So Bismarck does this thing called a web of alliances. He locks everybody into the map. Except, like I said, people need an outlet. Their nationalism needs an outlet. And that becomes this disgustingly ugly time in world history and in European and, and, uh, and even American history, we'll get into that, where you get this thing called imperialism, okay? When nationalism doesn't have anywhere to go, it becomes essentially, a lot of times it becomes imperialism, where you then, if you can't, 
fight a war for your borders, you then try to extend your borders outward into other places and you take your culture outward. And that's exactly what Bismarck does at this uh, conference. He says, boys, we're not going to be fighting wars in Europe, but as far as places like Africa and Asia and Southeast Asia and places, you know, in, from the American perspective, places like Hawaii and Alaska, all right, uh, places like Australia, um, and again, like I said, places like the Philippines, um, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and all the places in Africa, basically what Bismarck says is, fellas, have at it. Go take it all over, all right? Take your country out to those areas. And that's exactly what we get. We get this disgusting, awful time period towards the end of the 1800s, right here, 1885 to 1914. 1914 is an interesting date because that's the beginning of World War I. But during this time period, you get this really interestingly terrible expansion of American power and European power out into areas like Africa. Look at how divided up Africa becomes. You start getting French West Africa and German East Africa and British control of South Africa and German Southwest Africa and the Belgians get into it. They take over the Congo and you just get everybody wants their little piece of the pie, right? And nobody asks the Africans, nobody asks the African nations, Hey, is it okay if uh, we come in and bring our, uh, our culture, our, our ideals in here and kind of dominate, uh, you know, what you guys like, for instance, the, uh, the English with the Egyptians and the, and the, and the Sudanese, um, how about you guys all, um, you know, uh, speak English, uh, or in the French case, uh, how about everybody, uh, here in this area of Africa, how about you guys all speak French? Um, and it's not up to a vote of those people. It's sort of, you're going to do it, uh, or we're going to crush you with our military, uh, says a lot of these European and the Americans get into it as well. The Americans with the Philippines, the Americans with Hawaii, uh, and Alaska and other places like that. Okay. This is what happens with imperialism. All right. Uh, and we're going to get into that, uh, uh, over, uh, the weekend. Uh, and then into next week, we, we start looking at imperialism and then we're going to get into other types of isms like Marxism and communism, uh, because those are going to be all kind of in here together. Lots of isms coming up. All right. So hopefully you guys, uh, can uh, get into that. Um, that brings these notes to a close. All right. So for tomorrow, all right, hopefully you can um, watch this video. Uh, uh, not tomorrow, but Friday. Uh, hopefully you can watch this video, take some notes on it. All right. Um, and I'll also put up the PowerPoint just, you know, kind of to have the PowerPoint, but this video uh, is uh, our look at the notes. All right. If you got any questions or anything, um, let me know. Send me Canvas messages. I can't wait to talk about this. Uh, and get into your thoughts on national anthems and nationalism and to kind of bring this all to a close on uh, Friday. Until then, take care, everybody.